everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Lindsay and I'm a librarian at the University of Alberta and I have the privilege of introducing today. So as you know, we're about to hear from Jessica Norman on five lessons learned from OER policy. So I'd just like to start by introducing our speaker. Jessica Norman is the OER librarian at the Southern Alberta Institute for Technology Library. She has always looked for new ways to apply technology to information literacy and instruction. Jessica sees exciting opportunities with OER related to those topics, as well as to diversity, engagement, and accessibility. She has spent the last four years developing an OER program from the ground up at SAIT. So Jessica, now over to you, time for you to unmute, and um, we look forward to learning from your expertise. Thank you very much. So, um... Yeah, um, as Lindsay said, I've been with SAIT for approximately um, nine years now, and about halfway through my time at SAIT was when OER really came onto the scene. So um, it's been a, a journey for me professionally, um, as well as for the institution, uh, um, as we've kind of grown together on this topic. And specifically today, I'm here to talk about OER policy or more from an institutional practices standpoint, partly because that's the, uh, the focus that I have. Um, that's my role is mostly facilitation and support for others. And also because I think it's an area that um, is important for institutions and for individuals to consider when they're looking at kind of the long-term um, activities of OER at an institution. So um, it's something that kind of happens after we hit that high point of the, the first couple of adoptions or, or some, a wide, you know, a large project. And we think, well, what's next and, and how do we keep this going? So um, here at, uh, or so to give you a little bit of background, um, say, is a polytechnic or technical institute here in Calgary. And um, we offer certificates, diplomas primarily, and some applied degrees in areas ranging from business to culinary, health, technology, construction, transportation, manufacturing, and automation, basically applied education areas. Um, we are venturing though into some postgraduate certificates and we're growing our non-credit offering as well. Um, we have approximately 16,000 students in our daytime activities um, or our traditional programs and about 60,000 students at SAIT if you count part-time folks, uh, folks involved in distance ed and con ed, uh, academic upgrading, apprenticeship, dual credit, and some of our other areas that we run. So um, we're a decent sized institution, um, but we have always had a very applied um, focus. And so the OER conversation on my campus I'm very aware it can be different than what may occur at say a research university. But I still think that there are, um, there are things that we learn that can be shared amongst us all. In terms of the actual OER journey at SAIT, um, this, as I mentioned earlier, started a handful of years ago, about five or four or five years ago, when a, um, a couple of interested folks applied for grants from Alberta OER organization when it was funded through the government. And they were able to use those grants to develop some ancillary materials in the sciences and were really excited about the impact that they had. And so that kind of raised the question at state of what is this OER thing and is it useful for us, especially as a polytechnic and what does that look like? So in 2017, we had a couple of different activities occur. One was a report that I uh, co-authored around um, assessing our readiness for OER, uh, really looking at what it was um, at a, um, in Alberta, what was going on in Canada, but also assessing at state kind of what the awareness was, what the knowledge of it was, and if there was any implementation. And at the same time, the uh, institution overall was developing a education plan. And when it was released, it was the first time that our institution had a clear statement that said that it would support faculty to adopt, adapt, and create open educational resources because they were uh, the way to increase access to relevant, flexible learning content. So that sentence in our open our in our ed plan was a big deal because it was the first time it was publicly or acknowledged by the institution. Um, 
I've formed an OER committee with a couple other folks on campus and curriculum, and we worked for about nine months to develop a policy that was um, at an institution level. And it was finally approved in 2018. The other uh, change in 2018 was a change for my job description. So I became an e-learning librarian and I was working with not just OER, but digital initiatives in general on campus. Um, after policy was launched, we spent a lot of time then uh, advocating and communicating with our stakeholders. So our faculty, our curriculum development folks, um, our administration, and we had a student campaign as well. And then in 2019, we moved forward with a strategic plan for OER activities at SAIT. And also we're very happy with the fact that we published our first OER under our new policy and our new procedures. So we, um, we've put out other things since then, but those first two items were a math textbook and a uh, business communications book. Um, in 2020, um, my job title changed again, and I'm now the OER librarian on campus. I'm the only person at SAIT that has OER in my job description uh, in really any way. Um, although I have lots of folks that I work with that are interested in, in doing things off the side of their desk. And the other big activity that we undertook was joining the um, U of A's uh, Open Education Alberta Prospects Consortium, which may, has made a fundamental um, change or impact on our work because of the, um, the access that we now have to that platform means that we can really move forward with some really exciting projects. So that's kind of where we are in our journey and, um, and the steps that we took to get there along the way. I am interested um, about um, your journey though, and where you are in the process and the folks that are attending today. I'd like to know a little bit more about kind of how you are approaching OER. Um, for that reason, I'm gonna put up on the screen a poll that's coming from the uh, Poll Everywhere site, the polev.com slash SAIT 262. I believe Lindsay can put that into chat as well. So it's a live link. If you go to that website though, just take a moment um, and you can sign in or you can just skip over that and make it anonymous. I'm interested to know though, for folks that are here today, if you, which role do you think you primarily fall under when it comes to working with OER? So I'm gonna pause for a moment and, uh, and let folks chime in. Interesting. Okay, so right away we had someone who feels that they have a different role. If you do just um, feel that you have a role that isn't listed here, I'd be really interested to know what that is, if you would be willing to put it into chat. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? We do have a tendency to think of OER as a academic or higher ed, but it definitely reaches all the way down through um, K-12 and, and even into early education and outside of um, outside of academics or traditional classrooms for learning that occurs with nonprofits and other organizations. So it's, it's got a really wide scope. Let me just kind of walk you through from the beginning. The first thing that I uh, learned from working with policy was at the very beginning, because when I started this journey, and this was back in like early 2018, I thought naively that there would already be policy written and that we could at state simply find an existing policy and assuming it was open licensed, you know, in the spirit of the of the of our group, that I would be able to take that, modify that, and we'd have in very short period of time a policy that we could use at an institutional level. But at least at that point, we found that this was really something that was in its infancy and that OER programs and an institutional wide policy was really not in, um, not in existence. Um, we did find a couple publicly available in North America. So BCIT was one that we looked at. Tidewater Community College in Utah was one that um, I talked to them several times and, and used their documentation as well. And then I undertook a survey of, the, of Canadian institutions. I contacted about 180 institutions across Canada. Uh, with a survey asking them about their OER practices and their policies and basically who was um, working in that in that area. And we had approximately 40 institutions respond, most of the research universities among others, and found that there was at that time at least no published policies beyond the ones we'd already found. 
um, that there was no named positions at that time. So no one had OER in their job title at that point. Uh, there was approximately six or seven different committees and, and other like working groups, more of like ad hoc or off the side of people's desks. And a handful of folks had a formal training program or a formal grant program, but most people were kind of just doing it more casually or, or um, on the fly. So after that, I thought, well, if I can't find an actual policy, there maybe there's research about policies and best practices, and there was more of that available. So not surprisingly, doing the reading, I found that most policies had very specific information about uh, creating, adapting, adopting, and sharing OER, you know, it, it very clearly define those things, which is by definition what a policy does. But one of the things that uh, the research pointed out or some of the articles pointed out, which I thought was a good point, was that policy can actually be a tool in and of itself to raise awareness and acceptance on campus. So in other words, it can provide you with the reason to have conversations with stakeholders or to pull together a group of, of individuals, hopefully with a like mind. Um, it really gives you a reason or maybe some permission to knock on doors and to bring this question up to other departments or to administrators where maybe before it wasn't something that you know was priority, right? So, as the quote here from Green et al. points out, a well-crafted policy um, can reflect the institutional priorities, which is important because we need to make sure that the work we're doing does align and, and move forward those outcomes. And it can also provide support for practitioners, support for people who are working in the area, clear up misconceptions, clear up gray areas. And that those things will then increase the acceptance of OER, both from upper level administration, as well as the folks in the grassroots area, and hopefully allow, um, you know, an increase in OER use and OEP, you know, open educational practices in general. So I hadn't before that point thought about policy as a tool, both the process and development and the final product, helping us at state change our conversation and really kind of open that door. Um, Another report that I found really useful was from Educause. It was seven things you should know about open education policies. And I have citations for all of these at the end of the presentation and these slides I'm sure will be going out. Um, but that particular report had a statement that said that if a report is written, or sorry, a policy is written with flexible policies, that they can really help shift that default setting in your institution from closed or from a conventional copyright to open and the idea of open being permissible or being preferable, um, being something that the institution values as a whole, which means it can again raise awareness and, and this is their exact quote, it said it could nudge behavior without invoking concerns about academic freedom. So in other words, if your policy is written in a way that gives permission as opposed to mandating uh, outcomes, or it can set it up to say, this is now a possibility, then it could be used as a tool to help open up those conversations and, and um, explain to people the benefits. So I found those to be really useful things to consider when we were first getting started. The other thing that I early, um, early on thought about was that policy was something that was important to provide a framework for support. Um, when you first start with OER, most of the time, I find that it's a one person show, uh, that, the, um, that the activities are carried by one person who's very enthusiastic or maybe a small group. But it also means then that everyone looks to you for all answers and all activities that are ongoing. And that can be very overwhelming, right? It, what it feels like, as it shows on the screen, is that pile on when everybody needs something of your time. So the question I had very early on was, how do you transition from a one woman show to more of an integrated sustainable program? And I looked to policy to do that because it would document the framework at the institution, uh, the, the departments and individuals that would be available to provide support, you know, it wouldn't be their full job description, but it would be something that they could do. And it would also, uh, when the policy was finally completed and it got approved through, in our case, through our board of governors, I know in some cases it's more of like a, maybe a faculty association or faculty senate or something, but it would have that stamp of approval and it would indicate that these 
statements in the policy were something that the institution was going to actually act upon, right? Um, and so you could point to that down the road and say, well, the policy says this department will provide this you know, staffing or this technology, or I can ask for this because the policy states this is needed. As we all know, OER is very interdisciplinary and that's great, but it also means that within an institution, often it doesn't have a clear home. Um, when it comes to things like identifying the staffing available or the budget and where the budget will originate from, or even representation at a high level. So who's going to advocate for this within say the VPs or something like that. And so as a facilitator, because my primary role is not creating OER, but I facilitate and support those who are, a policy was going to be very useful so I could define those kind of, um, those kind of needs and then look for basically where I could hang my hat in different departments to make that our home, our little niche corner. Okay. We knew we had the barriers, as I mentioned, we did as much prep as we could before our policy was launched to gather that information up front so we knew what those were. Some we could address within the policy itself, but most of those, just so you know, they were not addressed in the policy. It was more around education about the policy. And I'll talk more about that in a bit because that mostly occurred after it was, um, after it was uh, made publicly available, after it was approved, right? The third lesson that was um, that I found from developing policy is that it definitely helped answer questions. So it's just that theme that I've already touched on, which is that a well-written policy makes the um, makes the answers to who and what is going to be doing the work and kind of clarifies for folks that maybe are concerned kind of where the boundaries are. Um, and as I said, kind of sets permissions, makes it possible to make choices. So one of the things that um, I do want to note is that state might have a different kind of a um, intellectual policy pro um, uh, policy than other institutions that are for folks that are here on the call today. In that, at state, our faculty work under contract that states that state is the owner of and holds the copyright or license to materials that are involved as part of their work. So. For us, it was extremely important that we had an institutional policy written that stated that open education was, first of all, allowed, because before it was not. It was, it was not written in anywhere, and it was assumed you were using traditional copyright. Um, that it was not just allowed, but that it was actually the default or the preferred license that we would be using on our work, and that it clearly identified who the agent of state was going to be, which in most cases was someone in our curriculum area working on a final project or the uh, program chair or the um, dean for a school, um, but they, they would have the, the ability to declare that an open license would be applied to a work and therefore it would be an OER and we would move forward with the other steps and hosting and things like that. Um, so for us, that was big because if, if we didn't have endorsement by the management, if our board of governors didn't approve the policy, we literally couldn't have the faculty make those choices themselves. However, I've heard from other folks at institutions where uh, faculty hold their academic or hold the academic freedom and have those choices, that having a policy is still useful because, as I mentioned earlier, it first clarifies that the institution supports those choices, has resources available, um, and it also kind of helps kind of set expectations of you should choose open, and if so, this is what it would look like. And it doesn't necessarily declare you have to, because we don't want to do that with folks that have that, that academic freedom, but it does kind of outline the benefits of it, right? And it kind of sets up that um, it kind of sets up that that culture on campus. The other thing, though, that I found was really important in the development of the policy is that the other question it helps to answer, or at least to help frame the the discussion, is the cost. Um, so when we talk about open educational resources and we pull out our definitions from UNESCO or other sites, it almost always includes the word free. That these are free resources, freely accessible and free in cost. And at least in the beginning, when I first started working with OER, I did have a few managers who saw that and went, ah, that's wonderful, no cost to my department, absolutely, we're doing it all. And I had to take a step back with them and go through the definition of, this is free as an accessible, 
It is free as in we don't want it to have a cost for the end user, our students, but that does not mean that there is not cost involved in development, whether it's staff hours, whether it's an offload for faculty curriculum work, whether it is the use of technology and, and needing to purchase particular software or have server space or whatever it may be, that we needed to be clear that state was going to have to pay in some way for these materials to be developed. And the policy was useful for that because, as I mentioned before, it outlined which departments would be involved uh, or individuals, what kind of processes they would be involved in or what kind of supports they offered. And that allowed me to then point to that policy and say, so if we're going to do X, where is that funding coming from? Or which group is going to you know, build this into their, their budget? Or if we're not gonna build it in, is it realistic that they can absorb that cost? And so far, for better or for worse, the outcome has typically been at state, we're going to absorb the cost, we're going to build it into our existing practices, but at least that has been a deliberate choice. And it's not just been additional work piled up on top of faculty or um, or that you know our IT folks suddenly find out that they're hosting a new server or something without some deliberation. So development of the policy itself answered some of our questions, made them very clear to everyone who was involved, especially when it um, especially when it was um, something that you know we needed multiple people to be in on them, the discussion, okay? Um, just to show you what we ended up with, our policy, which is publicly available, and I can send a link out for it later, but it addresses the issues that were important to us in our institution, which was that licensing uh, piece, the default licensing of CCBY, and the fact, again, that it addresses the uh, intellectual property and who the responsible parties are to make those decisions within our uh, academic freedom environment. And it also has a lot of information about how OER should be the same quality um, or will only be used if it's the same quality as traditional sources and what we expect is the minimum for selection and evaluation because we found that was a very important area to address for our faculty and for our users. They were very concerned about quality. They had lots of, let's say maybe misinformation around the quality of OER. And so we wanted to address that in the policy. And the other thing that we wanted to address in policy for our institution was the technology needed because we didn't already have that infrastructure. And so we needed to make sure it was clear that we would need to add some hosting and authoring tools and that we would need to look at a repository because those weren't things that we had at the time. And so for us, those were the important elements that were needed. So I'm curious, um, for those that are working on um, OER at their institution, maybe facilitating or working to support others, have you already developed a policy or maybe um, are considering a policy on your campus or in your institution? And if so, what areas does it address? Or if you haven't a policy yet, but what areas do you think it would need to address? Any, you know, any thoughts on that kind of on what the priorities would be within a policy for your particular institution? I find that there's still a lot of folks, a lot of institutions that maybe don't have a formal policy yet. They maybe have parts. So it may be that you've um, come up with a, um, a particular statement about how you're going to handle OER development as a procedure, or you may have within your particular department, say the library or the teaching learning center or something like that, come up with some internal policies. Um, it may just not be something that's been kind of um, vetted by and approved overall. As I mentioned, you know, having the policy in place does answer some of your questions, but I absolutely want to men, you know, point out that I know that it does not answer all the questions. And in fact, it often raises many others. I don't know for other institutions um, how it would work, but at least at state, when we were working on our policy, I have to admit we're, we were, um, we were not necessarily good at thinking of it as more of a um, development process for an overall uh, program. What I mean by that is at state in the past, it was very easy for groups to put out a policy and say, we're going to do X. And then they just, that was done. That was the end of the, the line or, you know, they hit their mark and they were finished. But we quickly realized within our group that was working on the policy that a policy wasn't going to be sufficient because 
unlike other areas, OER was being built up from scratch. And like I mentioned before, it didn't fit within an existing department. So we didn't have that to fall back on. We didn't have that kind of understanding of everybody knows this is what curriculum does or everybody knows this is what the library does. So we had a lot of questions raised that the policy um, couldn't necessarily answer because as we know, policy is really that high level overview of you know, kind of what should occur or, you know, where our parameters are, but it doesn't help with procedure and documentation. So we quickly realized in our policy um, committee that as soon as we finished that, we were going to the need to continue on with strategic planning and looking at more uh, uh, detailed procedural activities. So when the policy was approved and it went through our board of governors, um, and that got signed off on, we kind of ended up in a two-part role. The committee that had worked to create the policy shifted into more of an advocacy role. And so I'll talk more in a bit about our, um, what we called our listening tour, but we they went out and did a lot of work to um, introduce this policy and really um, promote it to folks. And I did some of that as well with the group. But then I also switched over to looking at strategic plan for OER and specifically, how are we going to do these things that were in the policy and really trying to earmark kind of some, some goals about when, you know, the priorities of them and when they should occur. Um, and workflow was another one. I mapped out a hypothetical project with a workflow plan because again, I wanted to demonstrate how many different touch points there were and how many different departments or individuals needed to be brought into these decisions that were being made um, so that the folks involved at the institution were clear about that this wasn't gonna be just, okay, we're making an OER and slap a label on it and we're done, but that there were all these other considerations around accessibility, around editing, around um, the use of technology within the product, um, all kinds of things that needed to be answered along the way before we had a, a quality final product for an OER. I wanna just kind of share this tool that we used or this report that we used. I found the Community College Consortium for OER, uh, Eight Steps to an Institutional Plan, very helpful. Um, I found it as we were working on our policy and we had already accidentally done some of the steps. So the first three steps are were done before our policy was written, right? We did an evaluation of our, our mission and, and our st strategic plan and our goals. And we looked at the readiness of the institution and where we were as, you know, like practitioners and things before we wrote our policy, which was good. But what we hadn't considered was the bottom set which was the um, setting benchmarks and assessments and looking at advocacy and communication, which uh, really kind of opened my eyes to write. The policy is not the end of the road. The policy is just a step. And in order to be successful, um, we really need to then continue to move it forward. So that's really what I use to help kind of frame the conversations I had with our committee and with other folks that were brought in as stakeholders about why we were doing this additional work and talking to my boss too about like, this is why I need to have more time available. And um, this is why my job title changed in 2018. And I finally was able to officially devote time to OER, right? So uh, the outcome at state, just so you know, was that our strategic plan has information about um, the supports that are available to not only adopt OER, but also um, training and support outside of that. Cause obviously, we need to have a framework for how to train people on developing these and, and open licensing and all those kind of concepts, as well as using the technology that we typically want to incorporate, um, like, you know, Pressbooks platforms and, and other, you know, kind of accessibility questions and things like that. But the big point in the strat plan was the second bullet point, which was to integrate OER and OEP throughout our institution. What did that mean? And what kind of areas would it integrate into? Um, and it also, the strat plan for the first time really asked us to look outside of seat because we had been focused inward for so much of our process. And so I wanted to make sure that there was a note in that strat plan that said we should be looking outward to how we could better collaborate with external partners, what we could do to leverage those, um, those strengths or bring our own strengths to the table. Um, really try to learn more about what else was going on in BC, Ontario, and other areas, uh, Saskatchewan, and, and try to, you know, basically 
bring state along with those or offer what we could in return for the the value that they were you know bringing out with their oer materials so everything in the ongoing development box is definitely still a work in progress a lot of things in the last 18 months have been uh well maybe not 18 months last year let's say have been put on hold due to our shift to rapid online instruction and to be honest the it's probably more like 18 months due to the budget issues that we had in fall of 2019. So we had a lot of, I had a lot of things that were going on. A lot of plans were in place for some activities or some, you know, some different um, resources and we've not been able to move forward with those. So kind of regrouping in the last year and reassessing what's really core and what we can do with the resources that we have. But the plan itself is still useful as a document to kind of guide those choices and really help us set priority. Uh, I can also bring it out and wave it around at administrative meetings when I get to talk to deans and things to remind them that, yes, you know, this is something we want to continue to grow and support. And, uh, and I have a piece of paper right here that says that they were all interested in it two years ago. So <laughs> all of those things really brings us to the point of my final thought, which is, I guess probably not surprising from all the words I keep saying along the way of that it's you know it's a journey it's a learning experience we've you know and it it really did though boil down for me when I started working with OER policy I just didn't quite know how much it was going to evolve into um into something that was going to take the, well, I didn't realize that it was going to be something that would become this important to me and my institution. I certainly had not really stopped to think about the fact that if we develop a policy and do it well, and we really bring in all of our stakeholders and we really open this up and it's an open and engaging process because we couldn't see how we would develop a policy around open ed and, and open licensing and not be open in the development itself. But that fundamentally changed a lot of people on campus and their thought process and therefore while we hit our you know our um our end point we we got a policy out of it all we you know part way through that journey realized that the policy was no longer the the destination that the policy was just one step and that we needed to move beyond and that it really opened up a lot of interesting conversations that were probably as or more important than the policy itself right so what I learned along the way for the policy or for the journey was that early on establish some kind of um, channel to communicate with you with all of your stakeholders. So as I mentioned before, state has often worked with uh, kind of a top down administration or, you know, folks write a policy. And we thought it was really important to have student voice and classroom faculty voice in that development in a wide scale. We also, though, at the same time, fully acknowledged that we had to work within our limits at state in terms of funding and within our um, and within our support structure, because our institution didn't have the ability to uh, open up a whole new department or hire additional staff or things like that. We were able to do that by talking to folks after the policy was completed about how this policy would integrate into their work. And so it was things like um, um, having, as it says, their grants, setting up offloads, things like that. And then after we had policy, as I mentioned already, having members of the committee commit to doing what we called road shows, which is where we took the policy in to our mid-level managers, our program chairs, some of our department heads, and really did a really uh, focused presentation on how the policy would impact their work and answer their questions about implementing it so that it was clear and there was no guesses on how to interpret policy. We also wrote an FAQ that's up on my uh, OER website to go with the policy to basically provide some of that context in clear language. The listening tours were different. They were just what they sounded like where we went out and had open uh, open house or drop in sessions. We fed people cookies and we basically listened. We had the faculty, the frontline staff from different departments, the, even students could come in and they could tell us what their concerns were or ask their questions. I heard that OER is really hard. I've heard that it's really not great content and I don't wanna use it. I heard that it's only digital and as a teacher, I wanna have a hard copy. You know, Those really practical, straightforward questions that 
we needed to answer before they could consider the policy and the, the larger concepts of OER. So, and we tracked all those statistics and that was useful too, to demonstrate our time. All those meetings, all those hours spent on the, um, out on different departments. And part of tracking statistics was also for me to keep track of um, interested individuals. Because one of the interesting things about starting off a journey like this is trying to figure out who your champions are. Um, Oftentimes, they may come from corners you're not, exe uh, not expecting. Um, you track them down through survey responses. You let people self-identify. They might come to your focus groups or to your listening events. Word of mouth, somebody says, I've got a colleague who's using this resource, and it sounds like it's open ed. So you can get a hold of them and say, did you know that what you're doing is open education? They may not have ever thought of it or framed it in that way, right? Students also would report sometimes, I have this faculty member doing this really cool thing. And so I'd go talk to them. While they may not be available right then to do work, I also found that it's important to note that this is a very long journey and it's a lot about relationship building. So not only to get the policy approved and accepted on campus, but also then to um, really uh, bolster the implementation was a lot of listening, making notes, and then six months or a year coming back to folks and saying, I remember you saying you were interested in working on this and that you might have time in the summer or you might look at a new course in a year. Is that something that you're still looking at doing now? And so um, it's a small or it's a slow process in the beginning to really kind of build momentum, but slowly having those coffee breaks with people, you know, uh, chatting about possibilities and, and really listening at least at state has been very successful for us to be able to build that momentum into full course adoptions, uh, full program discussions, and some larger projects that we can do now. So I want to point out that as part of that final journey, I also learned along the way that at least at SAIT, it was really important for things to be integrated as much into our process. So up on the screen are some general ideas. At SAIT, integration for us really meant focusing on not adding to people's workload. So what I have done in, at, at SAIT is simply to say OER is not mandated, OER is not required. However, it is something that you can consider as your ongoing practices, so as it comes up. That does mean that sometimes, as I mentioned, I might have a conversation and be told, this is not going to be something on our uh, radar for a year, and I have to say, okay, and come back to them at that time. But having OER considered as part of practices means that we now have it written into language for what we call scholarly activity. So we don't have tenure at state and we don't have the same kind of like publishing standards, but we do have a scholarly activity um, uh, policy and we have practices around that. And so one of the possible scholarly activities now is producing OER that then goes into some form of a national uh, repository. Um, it is also language that is now built into our what's called curriculum development process as well as a, uh, which is when brand new courses and programs are developed at SAIT, as well as course redesign, which occurs more generally at the faculty level or, or department level. They uh, consider OER as part of their checklist. The other thing that has been successful at SAIT is I do not currently have a budget for many grants or OER funding. However, I have been able to add the word OER and OER information to pre-existing grants, so pre-existing grants on campus. So for example, at state, we have something called the Cisco e-learning grant. It's been around for a long time. And it's a grant for faculty to have offload available to them and funding so they could purchase technology to basically try out new innovative digital practices. Um, and there's a wide definition on that. And so now OER is part of those digital practices. So they could, create a digital OER, integrate it into a class, um, and uh, use those funds to, to do work or have the time off to do that work and have it meet both requirements, right? It's an open ed because the licensing and its use, but it fits the digital technology definition for the grant. Um, so that has been done several times by our faculty as well as um, you know, them using OER as part of their grant applications for outside organizations and things. It's helped they feel them be successful in some of their grant opportunities. 
But on the screen, you'll see what other department or other institutions have reported, whether it's through like publications that I've been reading and have seen these noted or something that we've I've had a discussion with a colleague at another institution. So um, having the um, no cost, low cost, Z cred notes within a catalog or, or somehow within your course offerings is really useful for students. It does take a lot of work though. So something that might be easier to implement might be something as basic as having the student association uh, acknowledge OER um, and faculty that are practicing it. So giving them an award um, or having some kind of a like uh, a, a activity where they say, thank you. I had one, I heard one college in the US where the student association delivered uh, OER cookies to all the faculty that they knew that were reusing the materials with students for the week of open ed, just to kind of say thanks for thinking of, you know, thanks for doing the work, thanks for thinking outside the box. Um, and the other one that a lot of institutions have done is they may not have a formal policy, but the faculty senate or faculty association might say, write a, a formal statement that declares OER um, and its benefits for the for the instructors as well as the students. So kind of tapping into those other organizations on campus. The other thing too around the journey and the ongoing process is promotion never ends. <laughs> so promotion and advocacy is the one activity that will never uh, that I will never be done with and that I'm always thinking about how can I better, how can I promote this? How can I tie this in? What other kind of thing can I do to bring this to people's minds? If you're starting new with OER, be prepared to become that OER person on campus, the one that as you walk down the stairs or you get on the elevator, everyone recognizes you as the person who talks about this topic because you want to do it with whoever, wherever, whenever you can, um, because it really is one of those things that, you know, uh, you, you build the relationship or you, you plant the seed and it may take it a while, two, three plus years down the road. Um, on the screen is a picture that represents one of my best memories, our 2019 Open Ed Week celebration on campus. Uh, we hosted it through the library. It was co-hosted with the student association. So we had some funds for lots of snacks. It was open, by the way, to the public. So everybody was there, students, staff, faculty, and they, some folks even had a few friends come along. We had snacks. We had OER crafts to make buttons and to uh, and literally color pictures for the fun of it. We had an OER petting zoo um, with lots of materials out to, to talk through the student, uh, organization, uh, really pushed the idea of, you know, the benefit to students. And they had, um, some, uh, they did a trivia contest with prizes. And then we had lots of confetti at the end when we did a big announcement on our savings for students and the numbers. So right now, uh, as of last year, for example, we were able to announce that we impacted approximately 9,400 students over four years. And we've, uh, at that time, the savings on student uh, textbook cost was hovering somewhere around $900,000. And so while I no longer think that that's the most important number, there's a lot of other value in OER that goes beyond the, the dollar sign. Those kind of numbers are fun to announce and uh, they do tick a lot of interest. So. Um, it was it was fun. There was a lot of excitement from the faculty, the students, the staff, and I hope to be able to do it again in the future. So, and that concludes my discussion here today, guys. Thank you for your time. Uh, if you have to run, I totally understand. If anyone wants to stay and ask any last questions or anything, feel free to do that too.